Hello and welcome to another episode of the Express Economist. This week we are talking about road safety and the economic principles or the factors that sort of determine it. Uh, as many of you know, uh, we've had several news points uh, over the last two weeks. The most recent being the death of uh, uh, Mr. Cyrus Mistry, uh, former chairman of the Tata Group. And we also had uh, most recently the NCRB data showing that in 2021, uh, close to 1.6 uh, lakh people died on uh, due to road accidents. Uh, that's around 425 people every day. Um, and, uh, you know, we, you might have also read about stories uh, where the government has been trying to get uh, car manufacturers uh, give provide uh, more airbags, more safety features. Uh, and many of the car manufacturers, especially the smaller ones like Maruti or Hyundai, are resisting it, uh, saying that that is uh, that that will raise costs for the for the consumers. Uh, so, you know, today's uh, uh, Express Economist is dedicated to understanding what is happening on road safety, why is, uh, you know, features on car safety, for example, not such a preferred thing amongst Indians, uh, or that is the impression at least given. So, uh, please welcome uh, for this show, uh, Kavi Bhalla. Uh, hi, Kavi. Uh, for the viewers, let me tell... Uh, uh, Kavi is Associate Professor in the Department of Public Health uh, uh, Sciences uh, at University of Chicago. And um, he's been actually working on road safety issues uh, for a very long time, uh, since mid-90s when he was a student at IIT Delhi. And um, you know he has a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from Cornell, but his focus has always been on road safety. Um, uh, his current research uh, aims to develop transport systems that are safe, sustainable, and equitable, with a central focus on road safety in low and middle income countries. So, you know, um, even though he's quote unquote not an economist, he's is uh, absolutely the right person, I think, uh, to understand what is happening about road safety in India. Uh, so, thanks a lot, Kavi, for sparing time uh, and being on the show. Thank you so much, Adar. Um, and I, as I said, you know, there were there were a number of things that happened in the recent uh, two weeks that uh, give us pause and uh, uh, make us wonder what is happening on road safety. And I want to throw two basic contentions that we often hear about road safety. One is that a lot of people commonly say that Indians don't care about road safety. And uh, that is the reason why uh, you know, or car safety. That is the reason why we never care about or or, or there are so many casualties. And, and uh, you know, uh, it is said that uh, if you look at, say, say car commercials or uh, car reviews, uh, now maybe some things have changed. But, you know, in the past decade, two decades, everything is about, you know, uh, creature comforts, you know, uh, small frills, uh, but less about the crash worthiness of a car or the safety features. And even there, uh, the even today when the those things are coming through, the focus is more on um, high-end cars. The low-end cars are still struggling to meet with those crash test norms, or or you know the focus is still not there. It's more about mileage and stuff. So the argument, one argument, is that Indians really don't care about uh, safety. Uh, and the other argument, typically that is given, is that where well, Indians are just too poor, uh, you know, as as uh, you know, to afford safety features. For example, uh, we are considered to be a very price sensitive market. And the, the argument with, say, that Maruti apparently gave is that, uh, is that you, know, uh, you know, adding airbags or other safety features will just make the costs go up. And that will make it very difficult for it to be, you know, uh, viable in, in, a, in a price sensitive market like India. So there are these two views. Uh, that we don't, we are sort of in some way irrational about our safety and the other that we are so poor that we simply cannot afford. Uh, and I wanted to check with you uh, how you sort of looked at both these contentions and did you find them viable in your research and your understanding? Thank you. That uh, First, thank you so much for focusing on these issues in your show. I mean, I obviously think these issues are vitally important, uh, you know, 
this is my area of work. But I'm really grateful that journalists like you are bringing attention to this issue. Do Indians care enough about road safety, about their own safety? I So here's how I would think about it. Let's look much more specifically. Let's look at something like seat belts. You mentioned this Iris mystery crash uh, where the passengers in the back seat were not wearing seat belts, but passengers in the front seat were wearing seat belt. So it looks like when passengers are in the back seat, they don't care about road safety, but when they're in the front seat, they do care about road safety. And most of us are sometimes in the front seat, sometimes in the back seat, and so it's the same person who sometimes cares about road safety and sometimes doesn't care about road safety. I always wear a seatbelt in the US, in the front seat or the back seat. But I do a lot of work in India. When I come to India, I take Ubers everywhere. When I get into the back seat of an Uber, I instinctively reach for the seatbelt because it's hardwired now from living in the US. But there is no seatbelt in the back. So all cars have seatbelts in India, all modern cars do, but the seatbelts are usually buried away behind the seat because nobody is wearing them uh, in the back seat. So I don't find it, and then I don't wear it. I mean, I could ask the driver to get off, pull, pull the seat down, pull out the seatbelt and buckle, buckle, uh, buckle myself in, but I'm not doing that. I pretty much all my trips in India, I am traveling without seatbelts. Um, and it's largely because I'm not making that little effort. So you could say that I don't care about road safety. And I'm, you know, I am an expert in the areas. I know how important road safety is. Um, you'll see where I'm going with this in a second. So that was seatbelts. Let's think about speeding for a second. I live in the US. I drive exactly 10 miles per hour above the speed limit, always. I get on the highway, I'll set my um, cruise control to exactly 10 miles per hour above the speed limit. In my classes, I always ask students to tell me, do you drive above the speed limit? So I teach a class on road safety at the University of Chicago. And ev everybody immediately admits that they drive above the speed limit. So these are, you know, like I'm driving above this. Oh, I'll give you an anecdote. So this is uh, from like the 70s. There was a road safety conference happening somewhere in uh, Europe. And they had all these experts who were road safety experts at the conference. Um, what two researchers did was they went outside the conference uh, hotel and these people are driving in and they uh, used speed guns to measure the speeds of people coming in. And all the road safety experts are driving about the speed limit. So maybe they don't care about road safety either. Let's look at helmets for a second. Um, it, you look on the streets of Delhi, Everybody is wearing a helmet now. Well, not everybody. There's a lot of women who are not, still not wearing a helmet. And you probably know the history of that. Uh, uh, Sikh men don't have to wear helmets because they have turbans. So Sikh women also don't have to wear helmets. And since you can't distinguish between Sikh men and Sikh women, so, uh, sorry, Sikh women and other women, so nobody, no, none of the women have to wear helmets. So that would suggest that women don't care about safety, but men do. Uh, None of this makes sense, right? So what's going on? I mean, it's the answer obviously here is enforcement. When I was growing up in, uh, in India, nobody wore helmets. Now everybody does. And what's changed in Delhi is helmet enforcement. Um, in speeding, it's very difficult to do enforcement. In the US, they only enforce the speed limit if you're 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. That's why we set it to be 10 miles. We set our cruise control to be 10 miles over the speed limit. But when they enforce, we follow the rules. With the Cyrus mystery situation, the front seat passengers are belted because we enforce front seat, uh, seat belt wearing. The rear uh, passengers are not wearing seat belts because we don't enforce it. So I wouldn't say that Indians don't care about safety. You might want to say that the government doesn't care about enforcing seat belt rules in the back seat. You, you might want to say that they don't care about enforcing speeding rules. But actually, I, I, I don't even like to say that because I've talked with enough policymakers, decision makers, practitioners from around the world, and pretty much like almost everybody immediately acknowledges the problem and they're wanting to find solutions. I'd simply say about this situation, is that we want the government to enforce rear seatbelt uh, use. We want them to enforce um, um, helmet use for everybody. You know, it's happening in Delhi, but not in other cities. It's happening in ma many big cities, but not in the most of the country. But we should be doing this in, in most of the country. And 
you know, there's very little here to say about whether people care about safety or not. Um, the important thing to understand is that um, traffic crashes, severe traffic crashes are incredibly rare events. In the US, um, the likelihood of getting into a serious car crash is about 20 per 100 million miles. That's really, really low. Most people in their lifetime will not be in a serious car crash. To expect them to be taking decisions for their own safety with such small risks is, is doesn't really make sense because that risk level is so small. The problem is that when the event that happens, it kills you or it kills a loved one or it leaves you permanently disabled. So the outcome is really bad. So it's a product of this very small risk level multiplied by this really bad outcome. And I think humans are uh, just really poor judges of that situation. When you are doing enforcement, what you're doing is you're making the risk of the punishment be much, much higher. So the probability that you're not wearing a helmet and you'll be uh, you'll get a ticket is now much higher. So there's a real threat, but the punishment is really small. You know, you pay a hundred rupees. I, I don't know what you pay right now, but I would want the punishment to be small. What, what ideally you want is that people feel a very high level of chance of getting caught for breaking the rule, but then they're given a little slap on the wrist for doing it so that they don't complain about it too much. Um, so that's what I would say about, about this issue. Now, the, the way you framed it is exactly how people frame it around the world. And that's exactly how it was framed in the US around the world. And over, the, over this discussion, I'd like to talk about the US history a little bit as well. Um, but I'd say this, that when you frame it as Indians not caring about road safety or people not caring about road safety, the immediate policy intervention becomes how do we get people to care about road safety? And that is largely through um, you know, behavior change campaigns, uh, educational programs. Um, and those have been done for the last 120 years extensively. And because they've been done so much, they've also been evaluated extensively. In educational programs are one of the few areas in road safety where there's a mountain of high quality evidence. All of it shows that those programs do nothing. That doesn't mean that we don't continue to do them. We shouldn't, but we still continue to do them. Um, just simply because that's what people's instinct is that they think people don't care about road safety, so they try and educate them. But educational programs just don't work. There's, I don't know if you're familiar with Cochrane reviews. These are done in the medical field. They're the gold standard of systematic reviews of the literature of high quality evidence. There's several Cochrane reviews on behavior change programs for road safety. All of them say, they conclude by looking at all the evidence and say that these programs don't work, yet we continue to do them. Um, what does work is enforcement. And the only place these um, behavior change uh, campaigns work is when they're done in conjun conjunction with enforcement campaigns to help explain to the public why the enforcement campaign is being done, that it is in the public interest, and you know to make sure that people think that it is a fair thing that's being done. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. okay, so there's there's lots to unpack here just on the first bit on, on the rationality bit. One is that... Um, um my counter question one is the you you mentioned that the risk level is fairly low you gave the us example so why would people bother about an event which is so uh rare but wouldn't that itself depend on how many people are following traffic rules i mean uh, chances of that event happening in india would be perhaps higher with the kind of numbers that yeah. you see right so it's a bit is, higher that is that I is one it. thing and but yeah. but here's the thing, yeah. it's hmm. it's maybe four or five times higher. Okay. So if you look at death rates per capita, they are um, in India is about double what the US is death rates per capita. But there's so many more miles driven in the US that if you look at death rates per mile, which is what I was suggesting, it's a bit more than that. But if you take a tiny, tiny, tiny number and hmm. multiply by that by ten, it still remains a tiny, tiny, tiny number. Yeah. So I I mean I would say that I come to the come to India and I still you know, I cannot judge the risk for myself and, and and be rational about behavior change. Okay. And the second counter question that I had was that, you know, you mentioned that um, behavior campaigns don't seem to have worked. Uh, is that data only about US or is that sort of globally that has been the 
case? So the high quality evidence comes from the US, but it comes from so many different angles. So those programs, and also Western Europe. Right. Um, but it's like you, you the, the, the people have tried so many different ways of educational campaigns, and they all seem to show just null finding, no change at all. So here's what happens. Yeah. If you evaluate this program by asking people, like, will you wear a helmet? They all say that they will. So they learn what is the right thing to say. But if you observe them, they don't change their behaviors. And there is a little bit of evidence that children, that this can have a counterproductive effect, especially on children. So teaching children, for example, to cross roads is a very, very common thing around the world. The problem with those programs is that um, then parents begin to think that the children have been taught to cross roads. Children begin to think that they've been taught to cross roads, but they just don't have the cognitive capacity to cross roads. The only thing children should be taught is that they should not talk, cross roads without an adult. So, and and so you there is some evidence that it leads to increased, uh, you know, crash risk for child pedestrians if you teach if you teach them to cross roads. Okay. Okay. Last question before we move on to the next contention about about uh, income being a key determinant is the fact that people, even when they know what is good and what is bad for their health, right? either through an, a behavioral campaign or otherwise also. You can see that you're driving very fast or riding very fast without a helmet or you have a helmet and you're still not putting it or you're taking off the helmet after you cross the chalky or the post, police post, uh, willingly taking it off, knowing that you know this will injure, this could you know put your life in danger. Does that not go back to underscore the point that we are irrational in some way about our about our safety concerns. Well, so, okay, so here's the thing. That may be true, but it's not true of Indians. It's true of all humanity. Okay. So in the US, it's an incredibly common phenomena. So the US, um, half of all states in the US do not have a helmet law. Half state, half of the states do. Motorcyclists, when they drive across the state borders from a state that has the helmet law to a state that doesn't have the helmet law, invariably stop at the border and then take off their helmet. So they're doing exactly the thing that you said. So if you want to say that people worldwide are irrational, I think I agree with that. And the second thing I would add to that is you can't change people's behaviors, not through educational and trying to indoctrinate them. That just doesn't work. Or it works incredibly slowly because, you know, I'm in a public health sciences department now and people love to point out that smoking is a success story. But you have to remember that reducing smoking in the US took 30 years. Mm -hmm. So fine, like if you want to indoctrinate people for 30 years that they have to wear helmets, maybe it'll have some effect. I don't think anybody's ever tried to do that or measure it, um, but it's not going to be a quick thing. It's going to be a very slow thing. Right, right. Okay, now let's move to the second contention that India is a price sensitive market and that typically we don't have we don't have the wherewithal, especially at the lower end, uh, a four lakh, somebody who has a hard budget of three lakh, four lakhs, five lakhs. They simply just don't have the luxury to uh, decide whether they want, you know, better safety or this or that. They just have a hard budget constraint. They say, this is four lakhs I can uh, invest uh, and uh, let's buy whatever we can. And if that, within that, you want everything, you know. Um, you're trying to maximize some kind of a consumer surplus, you know, getting some, you know, heads up display or, you know, some Apple car play or something, you know, some creature com comfort. Now even uh, roofs are, uh, 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 are are massively in, uh, in, in fashion. So how do you sort of respond to this notion that, you know, is basically Indians are just too poor to afford safety? Indians maybe to afford to afford road safety but i think that is because of the way the car market is structured in the in india right now so let me try and explain what i mean and i'm going to point to the us again as an example just because that's the world i understand better but i have a strong suspicion that this is exactly how it might be playing out in, in india too so back in the 60s it was very common in the us that safety technologies were bundled in with luxury goods. So 
you got your airbags and your safety package alongside it you got uh, you know heated car seats and your sunroof and um i don't know high end speaker system you did not have the option to just get the airbags and not get all of the other stuff so and i suspect there's a similar thing that's playing out in india right now so if you want to go by safety you can't just buy safety you have to buy the luxury car the higher end car of this you know the uh, higher level trim i'm not sure if the word trim is used in in, in india yeah, this, in yeah, the same yeah, way yeah, yeah. So, okay so um so it may well be true now how do you fix that problem the way the us fix the problem is so what we want is for car manufacturers to unbundle the uh, the safe the luxury package pull out safety and put it in the um, in every car in the lowest end car also um you can do that through regulation right you can force car manufacturers to put that they won't like it because they were selling it at a very high price before and now you're forcing them to provide it not as a basic thing rather than as a luxury thing where they can charge much more will that increase prices that's the main question right and how much mm-hmm. i would contend and there is a lot of evidence for this that for many very important safety technologies that effect would be incredibly small on prices things like airbags i would say that airbags would cause the price of a car to increase by a few hundred rupees you might not be able to distinguish that the change has happened in the car price uh, because it may be prices may go up for other reason and this would be such a this would be noise in the change in car prices and the reason for this partly is because airbags are really cheap to make and they are mass manufactured because every car in western europe and the us has multiple airbags and there's a massive industry and now they can provide these airbags for a very cheap price and you can say similar stuff about several other technologies like electronic stability control anti lock brakes i would want the government to in, uh, require these in the basic version look i'm not saying that we want anti lock brakes to be provided in every car or to be enforced maybe there should be i'm not saying there shouldn't be either but that's that's a question for economists to sit down and understand anti lock brakes requires um, I, oh, sorry i didn't mean anti lock brakes i was i meant automatic braking so uh, automatic braking is a new technology it's showing up in more and more cars in the us there's an agreement that the government has brokered with all car manufacturers in the us that i think by 2025 every new car would have to have um um automatic braking it's not a regulation but it's a agreement um and but it requires sensors in the car it requires high end computing to make sure that what what you are about to hit a human being or a car and then force the car to brake i you you can wait for that price to come down for the technology or you can decide that we are ready for it right now but you know th- there's a economic question there to be answered i suspect there is no economic question to be answered for airbags as an example another way to look at this would be to think about um, the new car assessment programs so again i haven't I, I see the news headlines from India, but I don't read the news stories so much. But the way this plays out in, you know, with the Latin end cap, which I'm more familiar with, is that, um, you know, global end cap, the global new car assessment program, buys cars from the Indian market, does a crash test on them, and then puts out news stories about how badly the car did. Car companies typically respond very quickly and fix. the problems that have been found and then the next time global end cap tests the same model the same car um it does really well so they managed to get the car company to improve their car you should just go and look how much the price changed i don't know what the answer to that question is but i'm willing to bet that the change would be negligible and i'm also willing to bet that very soon because this happened a lot in the us when car companies ace the end cap test they really use it in advertising to point out that they are actually now a safe car and look the end cap program is saying that they are so it actually benefits them quite a bit but but you know you know just go check how much the price has changed and you'll see it's a very small amount right right so i mean um i i was just wondering whether this is also uh, you know a factor that you know some companies in india uh, and i'm talking india specific um you know some companies might be selling more to the lower end and they might be more disproportionately affected by something like this um uh, than some of the uh, uh, some of the other uh, high end companies which might be providing anyway you know cross all trips anyway so i mean uh, i think you made a very valid point that it's not so much a cost issue 
um, as it's being made out to be. Um, now, I want to just, uh, you know, take a step back and ask you about, uh, you know, some reflection from, say, the US or, or the European markets, uh, you know, because India is not going through this curve on its own. Uh, other countries must have gone through in terms of car usage. So how did they go about solving it? Or, you know, how did that uh, improvement in road safety happens or enforcement happens? What, what happened, say, in US or in Europe, whatever examples you can give um, uh, that India can learn from? Right. So let me talk about the long-term history of road safety in the US and Western Europe. And I think you know that I spent a lot of time thinking about this question, writing about it, because you wrote a wonderful article about it last week. Um, so here is what the story is. India has road traffic deaths that are rising, or you could say they are stable at a very high level, and we don't know what to do about it. Western Europe and the US had rising road traffic deaths until the 1960s, early 1970s. And then something remarkable happens. Road traffic death rates in pretty much across Western Europe and the US, including Australia, New Zealand, um, they begin to come down. Now, you know, why were road traffic deaths increasing in, before, in the 1960s and before? Why are they increasing right now? The reason is the obvious reason that pe more people are buying cars and there's more exposure to this risky mode of transportation. But it's not like after 1960s, people didn't continue to buy cars. So across Western Europe and the US, car ownership has only steadily increased historically. It's never gone down. But road traffic deaths went down. So this remarkable thing happened in the 1960s and 70s, which is that you know this business about increasing uh, car exposure leading to increasing road traffic deaths, that link was broken and now car exposure continued to increase and road traffic deaths began to plummet. And the question is why, what happened? Um, so we've done some statistical analysis of this, which you described in your article too, but I think the more, the statistical analysis is a bit difficult to explain in the standard forum. But I think the more interesting story is the, the political history of road safety, which I'm, what I'm going to tell you has been described by medical anthropologists, um, policy historians in the US over and over again, because the story is of a lot of interest to a lot of people, because you know you can learn how the US did well on road safety when it's not done well on a whole lot of other things. Um, so the story is as follows. In the early 1900s, once the car was invented, the car you know, was seen as a, there was a crisis situation, the car was killing a large number of people. Their road deaths began to go up. People were worried right from like, 1920s, it, it was a big issue about road traffic deaths going up. They tried to intervene a lot, and they intervened primarily by thinking about drivers behaving badly on the roads. My short story is going to be that the thought process changed in the 1960s from drivers behaving badly on the road to a structural approach where we are fixing roads, we are fixing the quality of cars, we are putting in trauma care systems. So that's the you know, abstract of what I'm about to say. But here's the longer version of the story. So early 1900s to 1930s, 40s, they're doing a lot of educational programs. And as I told you, you know, those programs just don't work. You can't change the behavior of drivers. It's just really, really difficult to do. But they don't know what to do about it. The main people who are participating in this conversation are psychologists who are trying to figure out why people behave badly, what should we do about it, whether people just don't care about road safety, they're worried about um, some of the things you mentioned before. Um, then something interesting begins to happen. There's some other types of uh, disciplines that begin to enter this field. One is emergency room doctors. So famously, there's this doctor called Claire Straith, who's a big deal in, in the history of road safety in the US. And he's an emergency room physician. And he begins to point out and lobby car companies very strongly after that, he points out that there are things inside cars that just cause a lot of injuries in a crash that just shouldn't be there. So one example of that is when I was in the late 1970s, when I was a kid, um, we had an ambassador and the door handle, the, hand, the handle that you used to open the door of the car, that used to be a thing that stuck out into the passenger compartment. And he was pointing out that in the emergency room, they get these patients who've been stabbed 
in the belly and that's hurt the internal organs because this thing stuck out like that. He also points out that they, they get these people, drivers who have these imprints of a steering wheel on their chest because the steering wheel is so stiff. Mm -hmm. You know, since then, things have changed. You you have recessed door knobs, even in all cars in India, steering wheels collapse. So if you hit a steering wheel hard, it absorbs energy now. But this was emergency room physicians, doctors speaking up and saying that there can be some structural changes to the inside of cars. By the 1940s, there's mechanical engineers. So famously, uh, there's this uh, lab at Cornell, um, Cornell Aeronautics Lab in Buffalo. And they are, um, they, there's this engineer, Hugh D. Haven, who's running crash tests. He's taking cars from the market, putting dummies on them, putting seat belts on them, crashing them into walls, some put, putting some padding inside cars in strategic places, and just showing that the amount of injuries go down dramatically. So what happens next is interesting politics, if not interesting road safety. So what happens is, Early 1960s, there's a young uh, lawyer who's well known in US politics now um, called uh, Ralph Nader. Um, Ralph Nader is in Harvard Law School at the time, and he writes an essay for the Harvard Law Review, which is a very high profile uh, journal. And his article claims that car cars have many design problems and car companies know about it. And they're not doing anything about it. This is noticed by some politicians in the US who've been pushing really hard to do something about this problem of road safety, which is just becoming worse, and they don't know what to do about it. So they've been holding hearings. So one of those politicians, I think he's Daniel Poitrick, Minihan, who's a big deal in US politics, hires Ralph Nader to come and work on this issue um, for him. Ralph Nader, a couple of years later, puts out a book, and the book is called Unsafe at Any Speed. Chapter one of that book describes how the Chevy Corvair has a design flaw which causes the car to flip over when it when the drivers make a particular maneuver. So if the car strays off the road a little bit and the driver tries to connect, correct, the car flips over. And the reason is because it has this uh, rear axle that GM is experimenting with in this car and that he claims that GM knows about this and they're not fixing this issue. Now, GM at that point is the most important company in the US. The Chevy Corvair is GM's most important car. GM panics. They hire uh, a detective to follow Ralph Nader around and try and find him doing something wrong. Except the detective turns out not to be as good as he's supposed to be. And he follows a news reporter thinking that's Ralph Nader. The news reporter realizes that General Motors has hired a detective to follow the Ralph, uh, Ralph Nader around. And so he writes an article about it. And this enormous media drama about how this most powerful car company, you know, most powerful company in the country is going after this young lawyer fresh out of school who's only trying to do something in the public interest. That results in, you know, again, politicians trying to use this opportunity to push through things that they think are really important. Um, they summon the GM CEO um, and ask him to testify. You know, Ed Cole, really big deal. Ed Cole comes to Congress, testifies. He's asked, is it true that you hired lawyers? And he says, yes, it's true. Sitting next to him is this young Ralph Nader, he turns around to Ralph Nader, apologizes. And it's a really big deal. So if you search on YouTube, you can see those videos, those recordings of this happening. This political drama that has just played out in the country gives the opportunity to pass really strong legislation. What that does is it establishes the US National Highway Traffic Safety Agency. There's two bills that are pushed through that basically create the US framework for regulation for road safety. And because this is so car centric, this whole drama that's played out, the US National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and I'll use the acronym NHTSA for it, because that's what everyone calls it here. Um, it's, um, they, the, their first order of business is to regulate car design. And I would argue that if you look at what happens after that, the US does incredibly well at regulating car design. In fact, there's been several recent evaluations of the history of improvements in the US, which say that um, about half of all improvements in the US uh, road traffic death rates can be attributed to better car design. And everything else, better cars, better trauma care, and so on, is, is the rest. Um, but you know, the government agency did all of those things. So um, so that's the regulatory framework. 
I'll pause here, but I also don't want to tell you about how the NCAP program plays out. But let me pause here and, and see if you have reactions, questions. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, it's 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 great to hear this uh, fascinating story about uh, about the the impact that that book had. Um, I think it was uh, uh, unsafe at all speeds. Uh, any speed, yeah. At any speed. So um, and 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 how it triggered a moment uh, of change, um, and how also the fact that mere fact that they were themselves facing the same kind of constant increase in deaths. Um, uh, as uh, as a country like India is. So it's not as if we are new to this situation. Uh, this has been faced by other countries and they've found ways around it. Yeah, so let me say a few things about what you just said that are really important to understand. One, I don't think we should view unsafe at any speed as being anything more than just a trigger for political action. Yeah. It has been argued, and there may be some truth to it, that Ralph Nader was wrong about the problem with the Chevy Corbea. NHTSA did some investigations 10 years later. The agency themselves did some investigations and concluded that Nader may not have been right about what he was arguing in the book. The point here is that at the center of this was a political process. There were politicians, there were engineers and emergency room doctors who'd helped create the um, solution, which is better car design. And then there were politicians looking to find a way to push through uh, what was sensible legislation. And they took the opportunity of the drama being created around Ralph Nader's book. I mean, I have enormous respect for Ralph Nader. He has a, a, a podcast that is really good. He's devoted his whole life to the public interest. Um, so, so I don't want to say that he's not an important person. But the, I would want to say that the important story over here is that they were engineers and doctors and people from a whole bunch of different disciplines working their whole careers trying to come up with good solutions and then the, uh, this political moment came created by this crisis because of this book where those that agency regulating car design and forcing car designs to improve as being that process okay now i want to pivot from this uh, you know uh, you mentioned about ncap but i want to add the last question that i wanted to focus on was was the situation in india you you've explained quite beautifully that it's uh, it's sort of incorrect to say that you know people don't care about their safety that's a dead end in in a sense um uh, to to sort of look at that uh, also that you know we cannot wait or shouldn't actually wait for in india's per capita income to grow and you know first of all maybe price is not such a big factor but that is not required and the solutions lie somewhere else. In particular, you've talked about systemic solutions and enforcement. Now, when you look at India's specific uh, situation, um, and I know that you you know you're sitting in US and you're studying uh, different sets of data, but you know from your understanding of uh, having uh, you know watched how things have progressed in India and where things are right now, you know are there one or two or three things that you think India can do, and it they, that it will benefit us. Some big, broad, uh, you know. Do we need a big, bigger agency? Do we need a separate agency? Is there too much decentralization? Any any reflections on that? Yeah, sure. So, as I see things looking from afar at what's playing out in India, it's a very difficult question for me to answer about whether we are on the right trajectory, but we are on a trajectory that is very interesting. So uh, the story I told you about the US, the key messages from there are the ones that we want to see over here as well. And the key message over there was that we want a political process that results in a strong agency, an agency which has resources, resources and a regulatory capacity. We want the same to happen in India. Now, the question is, have the last 10 years created that or not? And maybe they have, and maybe they have not. It is above my pay grade to answer the question. I don't think anybody knows, but we are. We, there has been a lot that is going on and that is promising. There's a lot to critique because I've read a lot of the critiques of what's in the road safety bill. Okay, so it's not that, that we don't know that there's problems, but at the macro level, there's action happening, which seems to be pointing in a very positive direction. So, so that's, at the, that's in an institutional sense. 
But let's imagine that these institutional things play out in a way so that we have the ability to do good work. What would that good work look like? I would say you should look at this in two separate streams. One is there's a bunch of stuff that we know needs to be done from just looking at what's happened in the US and Europe that should just be done run away, right away. And then there's a bunch of things that we can't learn from US and Europe. And there we have to do fresh new work. So let's start with the former. So for example, there's just no reason to evaluate whether helmets save lives. You know, it's been shown extensively that helmets in the US and Europe, like th this literature is from 40 years ago. We know that if you wear a helmet, the human head doesn't have as much acceleration and an impact. And the biology of the human body is the same worldwide. The Indian head is not that different from the American head. So we should just trust that science. And what we need to do is get helmets on everybody's head. So there might be some work to do to try and understand the way to get people to wear helmets, um, you know, figure out what that process is going to be like. And you don't need to look at the West for that. India itself has enough experiments that have been done. You know, I was pointing out how everybody in Delhi is wearing helmets. Whatever they did here, they should try and do elsewhere in the country so that everyone's wearing helmets. And the same thing you can say about seat belts, right? There's no reason to ask the question whether seat belts save lives or not. There's enough evidence that if you're inside a car and you're belted in, the human body is going to react in the same way that it does in Western Europe. Um, you know, biology is the same. What we need to do is make sure everyone's wearing uh, Seatbelt. So, so these types of things are just obvious need to be done. I'll add one more thing, which we are unfortunately talking far too little about, um, and which you know my mentor at IIT Delhi, uh, Professor Dinesh Mohan, who's unfortunately no longer with us, and clo our close colleague Professor Geetam Tiwari, who heads the Center for uh, Transportation Research at IIT Delhi, has focused so strongly on, and that is. India's road infrastructure. And this is sort of going to Cyrus Mystery's crash case, but we don't know enough about it. So let's not focus on it too much. But this business of cars hitting the divider or hitting a concrete structure on the road and you know leading to somebody dying, that is never supposed to happen. So in if you go to the US, you will never see a concrete structure anywhere near a high-speed road. There's two things they're supposed to do on a high-speed road. One is allow a car to successfully leave the highway if it strays. So, you know, just go, you cut down the trees around the highway so that they don't crash into trees, but basically remove any hard structure so that a car that strays can leave, this, can leave the road. If you cannot do that, and there's many places where you don't have the room to let a car leave the road, then you put a deformable barrier, you know, guardrail that if your car hits, it absorbs energy you don't put concrete on the road. That unfortunately, like across India, there's concrete on, on highways, high-speed highways. And you can pretty much talk with anybody about crashes they know about, and they'll tell you a story about somebody's car hitting the divider and having a really terrible crash. So that I'm putting in the category of what we know. And the reason we know is because the US did experiments. These are, you know, they took cars, crashed them into barriers, uh, to see what happens. And they it decided in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, there was literature that came out that and, and these tests were done, which just said, you, if a car hits a concrete structure, if it's a curb, it's likely to flip over. And so since then, design guidelines said we should never have a concrete structure on, on a high-speed road, but we do everywhere in India. Um, so that's in the first category. The question is, what about all these things where India is fairly different from. So here's what's going to happen. You put in these things that we already know, and it's going to have a measurable and big impact, but it's not going to be dramatic. There's a bunch of things that India needs to figure out. So you take car technologies. You know, the US has done so much work on car technologies, but they're only going to do work that matters to, to them, right? Motorcycles. There's very few technologies that we have for motorcycles that we work. There's one anti-lock brakes on motorcycles that have been found to be effective, but they've only been found to be effective for high engine capacity motorcycles, which are commonly found in Western Europe and the US. So, you know, they've looked at theirs, they found a solution. If you have anti-lock brakes, it, it has a fairly strong effect on reducing crashes. India needs to do those studies 
for low engine capacity motorcycles like the ones we have and if it turns out Out that this is an effective technology, and it's quite likely that it is. So there should be a matter of extreme urgency to to figure out. Then we need, need to regulate. We need to put that technology in motorcycles because motorcycles are the biggest problem in India. So that's an example from technologies for cars. There's also similar things that we can say about road design, and there's a lot more on road design that we have to do because India's road environment is so different from Western Europe. I can point to uh, th there's a lot. lot of interventions that are done on road design in the us which are just being blindly copied right now in india that could be counterproductive um if you want i can give examples but i have a sense that we might be running long already um but there's also a bunch of other you know things that happen in india a lot more like pedestrians getting hit by motorcycles that's actually a big problem nobody talks about motorcycles hitting pedestrians i don't know what the solution is because nobody's like nobody's sitting and thinking about it um there's things like um you know what do you do about people in the back of tractor trailers it, it's receiving very little attention or um, women with flowing garments getting caught in the back of motorcycles there's you know our motorcycles have um those cages that try and prevent garments getting caught in but there's no serious evaluations that have been done we don't know if it's actually working for example so there's a whole bunch of these things that we need active research on and so you know here the critical thing would be that this new agency that comes into place creates mechanisms so so that transportation researchers in india which there's a lot of have the resources you know they can apply for funds and actually go work on these problems that are really important to understand for india right right so that's uh, that's a fairly comprehensive review of of uh, the situation um i uh, hope that you know viewers have understood a few broad things one that it's no good blaming that indians don't care about their own safety that's a very important thing to understand because that's in first of all that doesn't distinguish indians from others so first of all that is common it seems and um, that's not a solution oriented approach uh, and even as 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 kavi mentioned uh, a huge amount of uh, behavioral campaigns also don't seem to move the needle too much uh, where the solutions perhaps lie are um, are enforcement of of laws having proper laws and then enforcing them properly uh, for example you know seat belts it's very common to uh see people uh not wearing seat belts when they are sitting at the back and nobody even objecting it uh, and um this was similar to the case when people didn't use seat belts when sitting in the front until enforcement made it uh very different so maybe enforcement is the solution there the other uh, thing is to remember that it's not just a matter of price it's not as if indians are too poor to afford safety we can uh, you know and and kavi mentioned about the details about how you can make the difference between trim levels and and ensure that all the safety features come to the starting trims and people have the access to safety features and perhaps cost is not something that will be such a huge factor that will derail the whole process um the next thing is that uh, you know there's a lot to be said about road design um you know and how other factors play into such road accidents it's not just about uh, people's their own their own approach to safety and the car's tech but road design and uh, we mentioned about the the element of the amount of concrete that is there on high speed roads in india um, perhaps everywhere barring some uh, some places where there are guardrails most places would have some concrete uh, and and that being such a massive issue um and similarly uh, some local solutions like uh, you know looking at uh, what technologies work with you know less powered motorcycles or you know for women's clothing in india you know is there is there a way to avoid that getting entangled with with the tires or whatever so i mean we need to do a lot of transport research uh, and perhaps they will give us more localized solutions apart from taking the benefits from from markets like us um thanks kavi for uh, giving us so uh, uh, so generously of your time and insights uh, and this is a very vexed issue people have very uh, you know sometimes fatalistic 
views on on this topic uh, uh, often thinking whatever has to happen will happen and really don't care uh, but um, i'm very grateful that you shared your insights about the story in the us how it changed and what we can learn from uh, many of these global examples um, thanks a lot for being part of the express economist uh, and uh, for all the viewers uh, if you like the episode please press like and subscribe and we'll be back next week thank you thank you